Hello, welcome to another one of my Dr. Sandler Chalk and Talks. Um, this one has to do with a question that was asked to me by one of my critical thinking students who was using VU to ask about things that uh, we, we talk about quite a bit in class, but which we sometimes don't get enough time to, to really explore in depth. And it's a very interesting question, and it has to do with the connection between two different concepts. And so we ask, is stereotyping always hasty generalization? And this comes up when we're talking about inductive arguments. Inductive arguments are arguments that at best are probable. They are not presented as being 100% certain. They, they do admit of exceptions. And in a good inductive argument, a strong inductive argument, the premises being true provide good reason or a strong sense of credence in the truth of the conclusion. Um, it doesn't make the conclusion necessarily true. It doesn't uh, make it impossible for the conclusion to be false. Two ways of saying the same thing. Now, Oftentimes when we're stereotyping, we are carrying out some sort of inductive reasoning about groups of people based on some of the members of that group. Uh, and this is why we bring it up in terms of hasty generalization. Hasty generalization is a common name for a fallacy or a bad way of reasoning, a bad way of arguing that um, tends to produce weak inductive arguments. Inductive arguments where the premises being true does not entail that the conclusion is likely to be true, does not make the conclusion probable, likely, um, plausible. So what is the fallacy of hasty generalization? Sometimes it's useful to have charts, and this is the chart that I always use with my students when we're talking about what are called uh, enumerative inductions. Or another way of thinking this is, how do you generalize about a group or about a given population, a given set of people or things? How do you generalize about those by sampling a representative, hopefully, a representative portion of that group? So there are a few technical terms that I'm using here. They're not the same in every single critical thinking textbook. But I think you can get the idea. The, the group itself, the entire group, is what we call the target. And um, why do we call it the target? Well, you'll see why in, in a moment. We're, we're actually, you might say, aiming the argument at it. The, it's going to be part of the conclusion of the, the argument. The sample is what we actually observe, what we actually take a, a look at. And that's a portion of that, that group. And the sample has some given quality. And we want to say that if the sample has this quality, then it's likely or it's probable that the group also similarly shares in that quality. So, for example, you go out to the marsh and you are looking around at all the frogs. Um, not all the frogs, actually, though, because can you actually find all the frogs in a given acre of land? Probably. Not. But what you do find is a hundred of them. And you find that 98% of them have a given parasite, a new parasite that is invaded. That's your sample, and that's your quality. So you said a um, hundred frogs out of maybe, let's estimate, 5,000, right? hundred frogs. 98% of them have this parasite in them. Uh, I'm willing to bet, I'm, I'm you know, inferring, I'm, I'm making a, a reasonable assumption that the larger group is also going to share this quality. So, that's not that big of a problem when you have a good sample. I mean, it's, it's not 100% guaranteed. Uh, opinion polling is like this. That's why they have a margin of error. And the larger the sample gets in relation to the target, the better the inference is. But you still have a margin of error, even, even if you have a fairly large sample. When the sample is too small, 
or when the sample is not representative, then we have a problem. So, I'm going to give you two examples of this. Um, let's say, we'll use a small sample example. Let's say you've only met three people from Wisconsin and all of them were heavy beer drinkers. And then you come to the conclusion, well, you know, Wisconsinites are all alcoholics. That is way too small of a sample to generalize about an entire state of people. Um, it, might even, it might also be unrepresentative. Let's say that you actually met these three Wisconsinites at the bar. Well, now you've got a bigger problem. The sample is not only too small, it's also unrepresentative because presumably you're going to meet people who are more interested in and have a, a habit of drinking uh, considerably. The ones who are visiting the bar, if you had gone to the zoo perhaps and run into three Wisconsin people and you saw them, you know, drunk, then, uh, you know, maybe it's a better sample. Still too small a sample. Now, this is how stereotypes are often formed. So this is where we get to the stereotyping itself. Um, and one of the things I want to remind you of is stereotyping can be done of any group of people who share in some sort of trait. Um, it can be racial or ethnic, that's what we often think of when we think of stereotypes. Uh, it could be in terms of gender, you can stereotype about the entire female sex, the entire male sex. Um, you can talk in terms of um, particular groups within those. Girly girls and manly men, you know. Um, you could talk about people from a given time era. Uh, you could talk about people from a certain age group, you know. Younger people are flighty and irresponsible. These kids these days. That's probably a matter of stereotyping. Um, you can talk about social class. People very often do stereotype about, about social classes. That's been going on since the beginning of time. Um, you can stereotype about just about anything else that you like, the things that people enjoy. Um, you know, you can stereotype about those who read comic books. You can stereotype about those who are into um, soccer. You can stereotype about, um, well, for example, when I, when I, uh, I used to be into endurance lifting. And I remember visiting a friend of mine in France. And he said, you know, it's really kind of tough for us here in France because here we're looked at as real, real weirdos. It's not like it is in America or in England or Germany where weightlifting is seen as a more common phenomenon. Those who are, and I don't know if this is the case today in France, but back then, if you went to the gym and you spent a lot of time there and you were there to lift weights, you were considered a little bit weird. Um, well, that, that could be something you stereotype about as well. Uh, we stereotype about athletes, we stereotype about weekend athletes, we stereotype about all sorts of groups. And what makes it a stereotype? Well, we have some sort of given concept with a set of traits, and we use that to make sense out of uh, people that fall into that class. So, you know, you, you see somebody with a soccer ball, aha, I know about that person. Um, we also do this with religion. We see somebody for instance, at, at a meal, you know, cross themselves, they're, they're a Catholic. Unless, of course, they do it the other way, in which case they're the Orthodox. Um, it's interesting because you don't realize that um, you wouldn't, in fact, have good reason not only, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. These days, if you see somebody in the United States, uh, especially at my age or younger, crossing themselves at a meal, unless you actually know something about Catholics, you probably don't know what that probably signifies. It probably signifies not only are they Catholic, it probably signifies also that they're a particularly observant or traditional Catholic, because many people in my generation younger generations have completely let it slide. Um, now, how do I know that? I, I don't know that on the basis of just looking at a few people and coming to a conclusion, but I know it by having, because I do, you know, uh, religious studies, and
and I keep up on these sorts of things, and these are the kind of indices that we like to, to look for. But we do research about this. We don't just rely on purely anecdotal information. That's how you get stereotypes, right? Um, now, how are stereotypes generated? Very often, stereotypes are generated through the fallacy of hasty generalization. You meet three Irish people, and now you know all about the Irish. You meet three black people, now you know everything about the African Americans, you know everything about not only African Americans, but Africans everywhere, right? But that's crazy, isn't it? Um, there are so many differences within groups that quite often stereotypes fail to capture or to accurately predict what sort of traits a person is going to have. You actually have to look a little bit more closely. We have stereotypes not only about um, how a person is going to behave, but what they're going to believe. As soon as you find out that somebody belongs to a religious group that you don't feel comfortable with, you may have a tendency to ascribe to them a certain kind of fanaticism, a belief in something irrational. Um, and it may turn out that that person is actually in the, the midst of a huge struggle with their faith and they're not sure what they believe at all and they're just going through the motions because they don't want to leave their religious community. Um, very often stereotypes can steer us into quite mistaken conceptions of people. And again, one source of stereotypes is hasty generalization. You do this by encountering uh, people in real life or perhaps just through, through television or movies and, and you get an idea about a certain group of people. And again, it could be anything. It could be about people who play violin. It could be about smokers. Um, some stereotypes are actually quite positive. I'm not going to dwell on that. Because where I want to go after this, and this is where we, we get to answer this question, uh, does stereotype, is stereotyping always hasty generalization? The answer is no. Stereotyping quite often involves a hasty generalization made by somebody somewhere along the line. But does it always involve inductive reasoning? You know, this is what I this is what I think about most of this group because of my experience. Inductive reasoning is quite often experiential. No, the answer uh, is wider than that. Sometimes there's also what we call deductive reasoning. In deductive reasoning, if the premises are actually true, the conclusion has to be true. Because deductive reasoning works by um, looking at, at uh, well, at least with, with groups, it's going to look at the inclusion of groups within each other. So let's say, for example, let's take a common stereotype about Irish. Irish people are what? Drunk and violent. Um, well, if you begin from definitions, you know, let's say you got those from hasty generalizations. If you begin from definitions like all Irish people are drunk and violent, um, that's a group of Irish people over there, they're going to be drunk and violent as your conclusion. Then you, you know, conclude further, I better get away from them or not. not not uh, provoke them. You're engaging in deductive reasoning. And if those premises actually were true, that conclusion would have to be true. The problem is that you're working from bad information. It's the classic problem of garbage in, garbage out. Deductive reasoning is unassailable when the premises are actually true. If, if the deductive reasoning, of course, is, is a valid argument. Um, there are ways of, of setting up deductive arguments where they, they become invalid. You know, for example, um, all Irish people um, love potatoes. Um, let's make up something really crazy. All terrorists love potatoes, therefore all Irish people are terrorists. Um, but we're working with false premises, but even if those premises were true, that conclusion wouldn't follow. Because there's something wrong with the form of it. The nice thing about deductive arguments is you can look right at them and see that there's something wrong with the form. I'm not so, so concerned with that right now. What I'm really interested in is the fact that we do engage in deductive reasoning based on stereotypes. Uh, so and so is, is um, Eastern Orthodox. 
the Eastern Orthodox all love um, John Damascene. Therefore, so and so is going to love John Damascene. I don't know that. He may not even know anything about, it, about uh, that, that particular theologian. The problem comes in in assuming that one has almost exhaustive or at least adequate knowledge of the entire class of people that allows one to engage in this, this sort of inferential process, deductive reasoning. Um, French people eat frogs and snails. Um, frogs and snails are vermin. Therefore, French people are vermin eaters. Well, again, we'd have to sort of parse this out. Do all French people eat frogs and snails? I don't think so. Um, are frogs and snails really vermin? Not by most definitions. But you see the problem here. Uh, stereotyping uh, quite often begins not from experience, where a hasty generalization would come in, but from just beginning from assumed starting points that one may have gotten from one's environment, from one's family from one's social class, from one's group. Interestingly, uh, our stereotypes quite often don't come from a more individual process of uh, looking at our experience and then you know, coming to bad inferences about this, but quite often from the very fact that we belong to groups. We're inclined to believe what it is that our group has to say, not only about itself, but about groups. And if we do that, we're engaging in, in uh, if we're just going sort of mechanically along that, that inferential line, we're engaging in deductive reasoning. So there's a good case where stereotyping not only does not involve hasty generalization, it doesn't involve inductive reasoning. There's also a type of reasoning called abductive reasoning. Um, and this is not often treated in critical thinking textbooks, and sometimes not even treated in logic textbooks. But it is an important type of reasoning. And in, in abductive reasoning, it's a little bit more loosey-goosey. Uh, sometimes it's called inference of the best explanation. There's a lot of different terms for it. What you're doing is you're saying, I'm observing something here. Now, what would explain that? What would provide me with an intelligible understanding of how this is came? The way it is. It's usually something puzzling. Um, now think about this in terms of human behavior. So-and-so does, does this. So-and-so engages in this behavior and it's kind of puzzling to me. Is there any sort of general rule that would explain that? Because if there was, that's probably true. That would then make sense out of my experience. That's a little bit different than induction. Um, with the induction, you're trying to sort of accumulate cases, and that's why hasty generalization is a bad, you know, induction because it goes from just too few, just a, you know, a small amount. It doesn't pile them up. I mean, if you actually go to a given population, let's say you you want to generalize about gamers, and you go to you know some big gaming convention, and you actually observe you know a thousand gamers, you're probably doing pretty good inductive reasoning. Right? Abductive reasoning is different. What you're doing there is you have a case, uh, and you're trying to, or you, yeah, you have a case, uh, an experience, and you're trying to make sense of it. So and so acts in this way. Well, why is that? Because they belong to this group. And if they belong to this group, those kind of people act this way. That explains it. Uh, that can be stereotyped. That could be how you use stereotypes that have either come to you uh, from your group or from your own experience, uh, insufficient experience, and that might be one way in which you categorize people too quickly. Um, great example of this, which is a little bit dated, I admit, uh, was All in the Family and Archie Bunker, that, that character. He was constantly engaging in abductive reasoning about the motives of people, and it was almost always based on stereotypes. Um, he's sort of a, a classic case in point. We could think of other ones. So, to recap and to summarize, uh, is stereotyping always hasty generalization? No, it's not always hasty generalization. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not always a matter of induction. Sometimes it's a matter of deductive reasoning or abductive reasoning. And in real life stereotypes that are floating around out there, often these things mesh with each other and reinforce each other. So that previous deductive reasoning gets used to, you know, make an abductive leap or hypothesis. Or a previous hasty generalization becomes the data which then gets fed into the deductive reasoning. Um, and this is how stereotypes not only get formed, but continue through social systems and get perpetuated.